Thank you everyone for joining uh, and we warmly welcome you to this uh, session on the power of anthropology in the business world. Um, before we start, I just wanted to give you a quick insight on what the Consumer Culture Lab at IIM Udaipur is. Uh, so we've set this up basically as a means to study and understand the Indian consumer. So the Consumer Culture Lab is really a collaboration hub for academic researchers, for people in the industry and for students to come together in this quest. Uh, we are doing multiple activities as part of this consumer culture lab. And an important part of what we do are these seminars or these webinars, uh, where we try and bring in stalwarts from academics and from the industry who have made a real impact in terms of the work that they do. So uh, today we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Simon Roberts, um, who is going to talk about the use of business on and uh, the use of anthropology in business settings. Really, um, I, I don't know really who who could be better placed to talk about this than Simon. So we are really, really, very happy and grateful that he's there with us today, um, and we look forward to this uh, talk from him. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to introduce the panelists. Uh, we have uh, Professor Julian Kaila, uh, Associate Professor of, for, uh, of Marketing at Nanyang Business School. Uh, we have uh, Rupali, Rupali Kapoor, who herself is an anthropologist and who is managing the Consumer Culture Lab and is really the heart of the Consumer Culture Lab at IIM Udaipur. My name is Rajesh Nanapra. I am an Associate Professor uh, of Marketing at I am Udaipur. Um, so together we really are, you know, a small core team which kind of runs the Consumer Culture Lab at the moment. Uh, that said, uh, we are kind of, um, you know, Simon will be talking about the power of anthropology in the business world. He'll be, he'll be taking us through this. And, uh, you know, the way that his presentation is, um, he has uh, different sections in this. So he's very happy to have questions at the end of each section. Uh, so you can use the chat function to kind of put in your questions. Uh, so we won't have a question and answer session exclusively at the end, but we'll have it as we go through this presentation. So without much ado, I wanted to invite uh, Julian to come and uh, introduce Simon formally. Uh, thank you so much. All right. Uh, thanks, Rajesh. So uh, for those of you who are joining us, uh, you know, Rajesh gave a nice introduction of the lab. The idea of the, the talks and the webinars we have at the lab is we are alternating between um, more academic talks and uh, industry talks. So we had a talk, uh, the first opening talk was on uh, stand-up comedy in India, which was more of a kind of a fun uh, industry talk, although it was uh, based on an academic thesis. Uh, then we had Russ Belk, uh, who gave more of a academic talk. And so in the spirit of alternating between more industry focused and uh, industry fo uh, and academic focus, well, here we have like a bit of a, of a hybrid, um, you know, Simon, uh, you know, was obviously uh, uh, is an anthropologist, um, you know, the reason that, that I uh, wanted to invite uh, Simon, uh, well, there are a few reasons. One, he, he has, uh, as you probably will discover, uh, a long story of association with, uh, with uh, India. Uh, he's actually a, a fluent uh, Hindi speaker who did his thesis on uh, satellite te satellite te television in um, in India in the 90s and did his field work in Varanasi in the 90s. And uh, knowing that story, I thought he would be like a, a great person to uh, to talk about uh, his research. He's also um, a very active member of Epic, having uh, you know uh, been um, one of the founding kind of members of, of Epic, or at least a very active member of Epic. Uh, he's also um, you know uh, someone who created uh, one of the first ethnographic research companies uh, in the UK and even in Europe, and uh, and also worked at Intel um, as one of their anthropologists um, and ethnographers in uh, in residence. So, um, you know, I think that since the Consumer Culture Lab is really about trying to bring more social science, more anthropology into the business world um, in India, uh, I thought that, that Simon would be a perfect person to talk about that. Um, and yes, like we, we're going to take, you know, questions at different points in time. 
the idea, even though we can't see everyone, is to make it interactive and uh, maybe give you a voice to uh, to ask your question. So raise your hand uh, or use the chat to ask questions. And uh, here's to you, uh, Simon. Simon, again, thank you for taking the time to uh, to speak with us, and I look forward to your talk. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you, Julian uh, and uh, Rajesh and, and, and Rupali. Delighted to be here. Um, so, yeah, and I, I'm not fluent in, in Hindi, so uh, not anymore anyway. So I'm angry may present Karunga. Um, but um, as Rajesh said, I mean, there's various things that um, talking with Julian and um, Rupali that... Um, we talked about uh, of potential interest to the audience. So there seems to be rather a lot here actually, but I'll, I'll, uh, Julian's done a very good job of, of doing the first section of my presentation anyway. So um, so we'll breeze sort of through things. And, and as discussed, if, um, you know, we'll stop a little bit and take 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 our breath um, for, for me at, at each section end. And, um, you know, these things typically work very well as, as kind of Q and A's rather than just me talking endlessly. So, um, so let's do that. But, but anyway, you know, delighted to be here and, um, and, and um, very, very glad of the opportunity to, to share a little bit about, about my work, um, which has taken me to some wonderful places um, within India, of course, but, but also beyond. Um, this is one of my favorite mornings of field work um, about five years ago, studying um, tech disconnection um, at a daybreaker um, morning rave in the Mission District of San Francisco um, with a lot of people that seem like they've just taken the bus in from Burning Man or something. Um, so, <clears throat> but it didn't really begin there, it began um, at the beginning of the millennium, um, when I set up a, a little company called Ideas Bazaar. Um, Ideas Bazaar has been the kind of moniker that I've used throughout my career and actually came from spending too long in Indian tea shops, which um, in North India are often feature in the newspapers. They're called um, Chachaka Bazaar or conversation markets. Um, and I've always loved, loved the idea of, of, of kind of environments if you will which are devoted to the to the sharing of of ideas um i won't go into why i set this company up other than that i knew that academia probably wasn't for me um and uh and i had a kind of conviction that some form of ethnographic or anthropological work should be uh relevant for people in business in a way that at the time didn't feel like it was um being used certainly outside of the US. So, um, so the, the desire was really to sort of bridge a gap between kind of market research on the one hand and academia on the other. So kind of more full-blooded, rigorous research than market research often focuses on. And with the greatest of respect to large bodies of academic work, a little bit more practical in its orientation. So just find some middle way between the two, um, between those two poles, if you will. Um, and as Julian said, I, have, I spent um, five years of my career at, um, at Intel running a research and development lab, specifically focused on health um, and actually within that, mainly looking um, at aging kind of globally um, in pursuit of, of sort of new business opportunities for Intel focused on the opportunities that technology might afford um, a rapidly um, aging world. Um, so I have had some sort of experience, if you will, you know, client side, as well as, as, as you know, if, 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 if I'm honest, the majority of my career has been spent uh, as a consultant, but I think that experience working within a large organization has been, has been really valuable to me um, one way or the other. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about Stripe Partners in, uh, in, in a subsequent section of this uh, presentation. Um, but we've been going now for, um, we're in our uh, seventh year. Um, 
and we're reasonably small. We're a team of about 25 people. Um, um, and I, we're doing work that, well, I love, you know, I think we've, we've, we're hitting our stride as a, as a business, um, doing work that I feel is really interesting, useful, relevant, and also, and I think the important thing um, ultimately is every business needs some sort of point of differentiation. And, and ours has been uh, to some extent around this idea of embodiment, uh, which is an idea that's, that's intrigued me for a number of years and um, led me to write um, a book about uh, embodied knowledge. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about that in due course, but just for, uh, for sake of background. So that's just to situate me, if you will. Um, and this has been a wonderful excuse to, um, to dig out my photo albums um, of my time in, in Varanasi, um, where my glasses were much bigger. Um, and um, I think my wardrobe was probably slightly better. Um, and, and Julian and Rupali thought it would be fun just to talk a little bit about what that work looked like um and what i was interested in because in many ways i think you know the continuity between sort of stripe partners and what we're doing now and that early field work in varanasi um is very much there um and typically i talk about it in terms of really an enduring interest in the relationship between people and technology um forgive me my dogs that are, are barking at some point my children will take them for a walk um so um <clears throat> i did um field work uh, early on in 1990 in the 1990s looking at popular hindi cinema and for no other reason varanasi than i'd read a wonderful book or a couple of books by um the anthropologist nita kumar uh one a book called the artisans of Benares, the second some sort of fieldwork memoirs called Friends, Brothers and Informants. So I really picked pick the city on that basis and no other, um, which turned out in my first trip to be a very silly idea because it was April and it was very, very hot. Um, but I, I fell in love with the city. Um, and, uh, and then I went back in 97 um, to explore the satellite TV revolution. Um, which in that earlier work on popular Hindi cinema had um, had started to show itself, if you will. So the family I live with would spend an awful lot of time watching satellite TV. Meanwhile, I was in the cinemas um, and, and I thought it would be a useful kind of contribution, not only to kind of, you know, the anthropology of mass media, but also an, a useful contribution to understanding a changing India. Um, so this is an India, I mean, this picture was taken late 97, I guess, or early 1998. Um, <clears throat> you know, at a time when, for those of you on the call might remember, there were mobile phones, but typically people use them almost as pages and then they would, they would pick up a call and, or not pick up a call as the case may be and run into a PCO and return the call much more cheaply um using um using the the uh, plain old telephone system um so you know very much as i think a, a point in the development of both consumerism in india um uh, that was that was very interesting um to to sort of try to to understand and my phd focused not only actually on the satellite tv revolution which took me to kind of spending time with cable wallers, because in many ways this was about cable-based provision rather than satellite-based provision. And the cable wallers, as they were known at those at that point, you know, were typically serving 100, 150 households. So it's a very localized form of media at a time when there was a lot of, you know, I, I think Aaron Do Doity Roy talked about sort of, you know, sort of uh, television falling out of the sky so this big footprint of satellites but actually on the ground it was very localized um, and there was also um, local uh, local networks in the city um, who would turn up and and uh, 
and record and then and then broadcast events from from the city and anyone who knows Varanasi knows there's an awful lot going on there most days um, of the year um, so there was no shortage of material for a, a cable TV network to start um, broadcasting to people and I was particularly interested both in the sort of micro politics of viewing within joint family households but also very interested in the gender dynamics of that so spending a lot of time in tea shops when I you know was sort of constrained by my access if you will to people's homes um saw what a sort of very public male public sphere that represented and actually what things like city cable did was was allow women access to an emerging um broadcast public sphere if you will so um so anyway that was that was that and and of course all was this all of this was happening at a time you know before one could use you know smartphones to record interviews or uh to take an infinite number of pictures um and um and everything was very much about just sort of writing things down by hand which i still believe actually is a very good way of doing field work and 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 in some senses the way it should be um and um and yeah just back to the context so outside of sort of tv and and newspapers of course what was going on at the at the time was um was the growth of of kind of uh, the growth of consumerism in a kind of in a context in which the sort of early 1990 reforms economic liberalization reforms were beginning to kind of get consolidated so when I wasn't sort of watching TV or reading newspapers with people, I was spending a lot of time uh, going to things like the grand openings of shopping centres, the grand openings of apartment blocks, and and spending a lot of time understanding the intersection between some of the traditional uh, Hindu festivals like Dan Terras and um, and and how kind of Indian consumers were using these as, if you will, as a not an excuse, but as a vehicle through which kind of different forms of consumption were being um, uh, executed, if you will. So lots of sort of, I think, con continuity between very traditional forms of, of religious observance and uh, given new expression through, uh, through, through different forms of consumerism. And I've I suppose long then been interested in how this is all playing out in in Varanasi. So, on the left, this is a an archive um, photocopy from the archive um, around the inauguration of the Dordashan, um, uh TV uh, transmitter in the city in 1984, um, which fascinatingly, as I saw it, happened just a few months before Indira Gandhi's. Um, uh before indira gandhi's assassination so if her goal had been to create a television net network that would allow uh india which at the time was going through a lot of secessionist movements in assam and, and elsewhere if her if her kind of desire was to sort of try to bring india together through the television it was very ironic if you will that one of the first national events that the people of varanasi got to see on television was actually her funeral from from Delhi um, and so on the left we have India's first built-in coloured screen come shutter TV set and then uh, from about 18 months ago in Varanasi India's first TV with artificial intelligence I have no idea what a, a TV with artificial intelligence does um, but I think that those two images side by side um, give an interesting sort of um, uh, sort of uh, give a, give an interesting view of, of of the kind of historical development of television within India uh, across. Uh, let's do some quick maths in my head. Um, Thirty five odd years, right? Um, so, um, and and I think the other thing I've I've also been interested in in sort of noting is the development or lack of the Hindi cinema industry. Uh, or at least the cinema hall industry. So when I last went back to Varanasi, I discovered that 31 cinema halls had shut down 
um, in the period since I had um, been there in the late 90s, um, replaced by three multiplexes and one sort of traditional talkies. So, um, so a huge, huge period of change um, and, and in many ways, a period of change that I have not, uh, I haven't had nearly as much involvement in or access to or participation from a research perspective as, as I would have liked to. So, you know, in the words of the famous, um, in the famous Hindi uh, song from Charles Sobis, you know, Fibi Dil Hey Hindustani, you know, I, I love that, I love India and I, I'm captivated um, and intrigued like most Westerners who've spent any time there. Um, and, um, you know, I, and I, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to sort of, to share some of this with, um, with, with a, you know, a, a broadly, you know, an Indian uh, community. Um, so I hope some of that was of interest. Now's probably a good time if people have a few questions to, um, um, to stop and, 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 and you may ask them if there's anything on the chat or any, anybody wants to say anything, otherwise I can move on. Yeah, we, uh, you know, people can raise their hand or, uh put that question in the chat. Any uh, questions? I know that uh, we have some people like uh, Ambi, for example, who has some uh, very long experience with uh, Indian marketing advertising. Could ask a question. Anyone else? Okay, a question. A question. Were you also involved in cinema? Uh, or, or media well, there's lots of people that managed to get roped into being an extra on a hindi film at some point sadly that opportunity never arose um i did obviously appear in various guises um on the local city network um you know as i because I, I tended to sort of look in the newspapers each day to see what was happening around town and then i would i would show up and and meet the tv crews and stuff but no, sadly, I was never in a film, um, but th that can be in my next life. Um, I can see another couple of questions here. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a piece about why writing by hand, um, I think from Rebecca Scott. Um, well, why, why do I like that? Why is that the way it should be? Um, I, well, the simple answer is I'm very old fashioned. Um, perhaps the more sophisticated answer is that um, the act of writing, I believe when you're doing field work is incredibly important to, uh, to write as quickly as possible, either during or, you know, after the event, if that's not possible. Um, and, and personally, you know, perhaps I shouldn't say that's the way it should be, but I think, you know, it's very easy to turn sort of field work these days into a sort of technological arms race. And actually, I think as much as anything, it's about being there with your body and being involved and not building, putting too many contraptions, if you will, between you and the world that you're trying to experience. Um, and I'm also, you know, struck that there's quite a lot of evidence that, for example, the mere act of reading books on paper rather than reading them on Kindle aids retention. There's quite a lot of evidence around that. So um, partly I'm old fashioned and, and partly I'm, I'm old fashioned, I think, because there's some science behind being old fashioned. We have another question uh, from Sonia, which is around the methodology that you followed. So you mm. could shed some light on that. The methodology I followed when I was doing field work in India or, or nowadays? Um, I think for your field work, yeah. Um, well, I mean, this is, <clears throat> you know, British anthropology is, inc you know, at least at some, to some degree is rather old fashioned. And although we did do field work training, in many ways it was, you know, I was still part of a, a cohort or in an era where it was kind of just go there, it, it will be all right. Um, you know, my approach, which I've reflected on a lot over the years, um, didn't involve a number of things which I would have probably done, uh, I would do differently now. Um, but, but really it was about, it was about trying to, you know, befriend, become involved in the lives of, of a range of different households 
and spend time watching TV with them. So um, I, some of you may remember a, a, a soap opera called Shanty. You know, so I, I'd, I'd have appointments to go and view, uh, watch, you know, programs with people. Um, and, and, and as much as possible, I tried to just really be in people's homes watching TV. Um, and then when I couldn't be doing that, I was, you know, set myself kind of ridiculous tasks, like trying to find every single cable waller in the entire city. Um, and I spent a lot of time just hanging out in TV, um, you know, in shops selling TVs. And um, I spent a lot of time in tea shops, an awful lot of time in tea shops, smoking, you know, cigarettes, drinking tea, and talking about what was going on in the city, and then following up on those leads and and spending time that way. So in many ways, it was just, it was very traditional sort of long-term participant observation um, with, you know, inter interspersed with the de degrees of sort of quite, quite sort of more structured sort of survey based activity around particular neighborhoods. We have another question from Soumya. Uh, mm. What are your thoughts on biases that come with using media in research? What do you think it does to the embodiment aspect of ethnography? Does it maintain the reflexibility or blurs or lines? Um, maybe I can come to that. I mean, and, and, and partly because I don't quite understand the gist of the question in terms of using media in research. So does that mean, you know, uh, so maybe Sonia, you could you could clarify that, and I could come to talk a bit more about that in a subsequent section yeah. of the presentation. You, yeah, what I would suggest is at this stage, uh, you know, we just uh, move on. Next section. I see a lot of questions which are almost like you know would require uh, you know an, an entire course on uh, mm. on anthropology. You know, I have questions about how is this anthropology different from sociology? What kind of uh, methods or key key points to do while doing field work you know i feel like yeah. i mean we could teach a class about cultural anthropology and ethnography but this is not this is not the idea yeah. here right i mean in the same way that we wouldn't do a, a webinar trying to teach people statistics so this yeah. is not this is not the idea of the of okay. the webinar so i'm sorry if we're going to disappoint some of these some of these questions are going to be just too long to answer in just uh just okay one and a half hours. yeah that makes sense so yeah. <laughs> so so the, so the next bit, and again, you know, I can truncate this, but I, you know, it's just to give a little bit of a flavor of, of the history as I see it, uh, and obviously based on a lot of other people and what they've written, on just the sort of historical development of, of anthropology and business, right? Because this didn't just sort of come out of nowhere, and I would certainly would not claim to be, um, to be the first to do this um, by any by any means, um, and I think the story is a really interesting one, um, and it, and it's a much older one than you know. Typically, when journalists sort of talk to people like me, um, you know, they they sort of tend to sort of make out that they've discovered kind of people in pith helmets in corporate environments, right? And it's it's really tedious because it's so inaccurate and the most small amount of research would correct them. Um, but there is a very long history to this. Um, and it's a history where I think British academic anthropology has been um, kind of largely, at least in the beginning, kind of absent without leave. Um, and interestingly, it was a lot of British anthropologists who were involved in some of these early endeavors in the late 1920s, and early, early 30s. Um, you know, doing kind of industrial anthropology. So Radcliffe Brown particularly was heavily involved in this, but, um, but British anthropology was very squeamish. Um, you know, it was very unwilling as it were to be polluted by the idea of, of doing um, anthropology in some sort of commercial setting. Um, and these kinds of projects, such as that, those that went on at Western Electric, um, were ones that uh, span out into the world of consumer research and into advertising research with companies like Social Research Inc, which was based in Chicago. So, so there is a kind of a, there is a kind of a clear beginning, and then it gets. I think the story is sort of interesting because it gets slightly lost in the mists of time, 
and and journalists usually sort of pick it up in in this point of in history when um, Xerox um, Park or Palo Alto Research Center, to give it its full name, um, started to use the work not only of anthropologists but of uh, human computer kind of interaction um, and workplace ethnographers like Julian Orr um, and kind of to some extent, I suppose, the early early forms of 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 of, um, of science and technology studies scholars. Um, so the story is usually kind of picked up again in the 70s when this work was was going on. Um, and, and in respect to, to, to the UK, um, actually, I think it was really in the late 90s that the idea of putting people at the center of, of how we develop policy, of how we build public services, was given uh, was given impetus by um, the new Labour re regime under Tony Blair, um, and that led to a whole range of of, of kind of, of of activities in places like the Design Centre, and sort sort of started to establish really a, a, what I see as a kind of norm around the idea that if you're going to build things for people, you need to talk to them first, right? And I think. Yeah, I would sort of separate out a little bit, kind of the marketing, uh, marketing and communications world from the world of of innovation. Uh, we can talk a bit about that at some other time, perhaps. But um, but if you want to invent and design new services, you need to sort of start with people. I think, and 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 build build from from the ground up. Excuse me, around them. I think marketing communications people have been doing this for for rather longer actually um but when i think at this point in history you know this this kind of realization became much more uh much more central to um not least to sort of government government policy um and and then anthropology fell in with with big tech um so for kind of point of of, of historical reference the first uh, paid up PhD anthropologist was hired into Intel in 1998. Um, so reasonably recent. Um, I joined in 2005 in an intake of about another 35 on top of, you know, the 10 that were already there. So this is quite recent. Um, and of course, now you've got companies like Facebook with four or five hundred uh, user researchers of different varieties, Microsoft, Google, you name it, they've all got um, large numbers of people that look somewhat like me. Luckily, they're not all male and they're not all white, but um, they've got the same sort of broad disciplinary background and, um, and I suppose the same commitment to, um, to putting people um, first, um, if you will, um, in the process of, of inventing new products, services, technologies, experiences, um, and perhaps the same disciplinary commitment to, um, although it, it seems to be increasingly difficult, but to speak truth to power, right? I mean, and there's a long, and perhaps we won't get into it today, but I think a long, uh, how do I put it? Um, there's a long, there's a long sort of history or sense of identity that people like myself working in industry have around the importance of trying to reframe discussions, reframe debates. Um, you know, technologists can ultimately build anything. So the question is, well, why would you want to build that thing? Who is it for? What are the anticipated or even unanticipated consequences of you building it? So I think a lot. These are some of the questions that people working in big tech companies um, are trying to ask, are trying to be, are trying to be awkward about, if if that makes sense. Um, trying to ask the difficult questions um, because otherwise, I think these, uh, particularly the big technology companies, the juggernauts. Um, 
that uh, leave the world um, un flat underneath them unless people can stand up and say, hey, you haven't thought about this or you haven't thought about that. Um, and so I think it's easy now to claim and pretty uncontroversial to say that that anthropology is ult ultimately very central to the world of business. And whilst the occasional lazy journalist will find um, find the ability to uh, to claim that they've discovered the use of anthropology in business and, and suggest that it's a new thing. Um, it isn't at all. I can't imagine there's any self-respecting CEO of any half decent sized company nowadays who doesn't know what anthropology is, who doesn't have maybe even some understanding of what an ethnographic approach might look like. Um, and there's a really wonderful canon of books that talk about this work um you know in very distinctive reflexive um ways so um and there's even a there's even a community which i i i very much um recommend you um take a look at um epicpeople.org um there's a free membership there's a paid membership but there's plenty on offer for, uh, for the free membership um, if, if, if your resources don't enable a paid membership. And it's very much a, a global community of, of about 10,000 people who are, you know, who are pursuing this kind of work in a whole range of different organizations. So that is my whistle stop tour of, um, of anthropology from sort of 1920 to 2020. Um, lots of gaps but i've got lots of references and anyone that's interested i can i can put them on an email and and share them with you so if there are any questions on on any of that let me know otherwise we'll we'll can move I, on can i ask a, a, a quick question actually since mm. i uh, I'm, I'm curious uh if you don't mind uh, simon uh and then, um i mean you mentioned that a lot of the big technology companies like google facebook have lots of uh, user researchers um but I saw them on your list of clients. Yeah. Uh, so the yeah. question is if they have teams of, if Google has a team of 300 and Facebook has yeah. a team of 400, yeah. how did you manage to, uh, to get them as clients? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think, um, <clears throat> I mean, partly the, the, the sort of really honest answer to that is that I think oftentimes, um, you know, companies like ours are used to, to run more, um, to run more complicated international kind of global work. So often those kind of individuals might run a single, a single market study for themselves. Um, so that's, that's sort of one answer. I think the other answer is that um, an external perspective is nearly always valuable to organizations. And, and I know that people love to hate consultants. Um, they think we're a terrible waste of money. And, you know, the old adage, you know, you, you ask a consultant what the time is and they, you know, um, or you ask your consultant for a watch and they tell you what the time is and send you a, send you a bill for it. Um, you know, people love to hate consultants, but actually, you know, consultants provide something which um, comes from the outside and that's often very valuable. Our clients often talk about us as thought partners. In other words, they're people that can help push their thinking and um and they can do we can do that in an environment in which we can put in, in you know we can put a team on a project for 10 to 12 weeks and really think about a, a problem um in a dedicated way and and typically you know they may be able to find you know half an hour or an hour a day outside of meetings to be able to focus on something so i think for a lot of me a lot of it for me is about actually you know, you are buying the time of people to think about a problem. And I think that's very hard um, for employees to do in modern organizations that uh, that fill their um, employees' diaries with lots of half hour meetings and flush any ability to think out of the system. Thank you. Yeah, there was a question from uh, Ambi. I think that was a good question. Uh, can you share some specific examples, innovations, products, services, that came out of anthropology research, not the usual consumer research, right? Um, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's funny that question. It's sort of on the face of it, it's the easiest question in the world. Um, 
on the other it's the most complicated so why is it the most complicated because in many ways i think a lot of what anthropology is doing is is about trying to change the debate it's trying to reframe conversations about things it's trying to help people think differently and as such it's really about a project of um of cultural uh or organizational change so um so that is the kind of that is the slippery consultants kind of response to that question right and I still think that's true. Um, a lot of what we're trying to do is not necessarily to say, build this because, you know, we have an insight around, around the following thing. We're actually saying, you know, here's a different way of looking at this problem space um, or this opportunity space or, or whatever. So, um, so, you know, let's go back to, in but in terms of sort of material outputs, um, you know let's go back to xerox park um and uh and the work of um the teams there you know multidisciplinary teams um working on complex te technologies like photocopiers working on new forms of interaction between humans and computers so this is a world in which you know the mouse and the graphical user interface emerged out of so I'm not claiming that those are the offspring of anthropologists alone. What I'm suggesting is they're the offspring of, 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 of kind of different mindsets, different capabilities, different disciplinary perspectives and capabilities working together to solve a difficult problem, which is how are people going to communicate with a computer without, um, without having to write code? um so so that would be for me you know almost the archetypical kind of um output of of anthropology applied in a multidisciplinary setting um i'm not sure whether that answers the question um but i'm i've always been very uncomfortable partly because i'm not a you know i'm not a natural salesman um but i've, I've always been very un uncomfortable with the idea that that the work that I do leads in some kind of linear, you know, sort of straight line way to, to an output, to an outcome. I think organizations are more complex than that. It's, it's not really the case that I do this and the organization does that as a sort of, as a response. Um, and, and so I, I much prefer to sort of, to try to complexify that picture a little bit and, and think about the different ways in which you have impact. Um, to go back to the idea of the Chachaka Bazaar, you know, it's about what you're feeding into a into an environment in which conversations are happening. Um, and you know, the history of innovation shows that that is indeed how innovation happens. It's it's as much as anything about combination um, as it is about you know light bulb moments. It's it's about combining existing ideas in different new ways all right i guess there are lots of questions along the same line about um you know since you you are uh, interacting with the world of big tech yeah uh, how do you advance like the i want to say the the cause of uh, ethnography anthropology uh when you're surrounded by people who know the power of uh you know big data and massive amounts of data i mean do you do you do you face that challenge uh, i'm sure you do um, um and so how do you face that challenge yeah i mean i suppose this is the kind of not this is the battle you know this is the kind of the landscape in which this work now happens right um if you're working in a large or for, in or for a large technology company um and i think you know we've all seen instances in the last few months where people pursuing agendas around kind of uh, research of the impact of algorithms and bias and discrimination 
have not even managed to um have been expelled if you will been sacked let's put it let's use plain english have been sacked by the companies they work for so this is deeply political and politicized at the moment um you know so the work that we do you know touches you know i need to be kind of i you know I don't want to claim kind of a, 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 a kind of omnipotence when it comes to the impact that we can have, nor do I want to suggest that we are, um, you know, that we go into this kind of completely unaware of the environment in which we are working or, um, but I think, you know, a lot of this is about sort of working quite closely with engineers um, and data scientists to help them better appreciate the world beyond their, uh, their development environment and the world beyond, you know, the platform they're working on. Um, I'm clearly limited for commercial reasons to kind of give, you know, too many very specific examples, but I think our work with Spotify has given me a huge amount of confidence that when we have the right sorts of conversations and the right sorts of interactions with data scientists and developers, we can play a very useful and I think a benign role in shaping not only the kinds of experiences that are meaningful for kind of the end user but can also take into account in the in the context of spotify the needs of creators on that platform too so there is no magic bullet here um algorithms are are clearly very powerful they shape our perception and experience of the world in ways that i think you know it's quite difficult to kind of truly comprehend even frankly if you're writing them um and the job yet again is one for me of of kind of long-term cultural um engagement with the people that are designing these systems um rather than um rather than suggesting that there's some sort of quick fix um so again i don't know whether that answers the question um, but I've always held the view it's better to be um, a critic in the tent, as it were, than a critic outside of the tent. All right. Um, I mean, we have a lot of questions, including some questions about people who are interested in, uh, you know, getting jobs maybe in this field. Um, yeah. But maybe we can leave those maybe for the end. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Want to go? Uh, if you we crack on. Yeah, um, and I'll either, yeah, I mean, and I'll, I may answer some of the questions that are there. Um, and if I don't, we can always come back to them. Um, so I talked a bit earlier about, about embodiment and I talked about Stripe Partners. And I think for anyone trying to set up a business in this space, although there aren't huge numbers of, of anthropology businesses, um, uh, you know, it's still important, you know, for any product or service provider to have a point of differentiation. So, you know, in the early days, you know, our question was, well, why are we different? You know, what are we, uh, what are we offering that is, um, what are we offering that's, that's different from everybody else? And, and I think one of the things that we realized was that, and I had realized having worked in a, in a sort of long wavelength research environment like Intel, was that um, um, that um, you know that the answer to having impact in an organization is not about making your PowerPoint presentation look better, right? That's not necessarily the answer. In fact, very rarely is it the answer. Um, you know, there's a lot of understanding that a um, that an anthropologist gets from doing field work that um, gets flattened out when you try to present it in a PowerPoint document. 
So what we were trying to think of was, well, how can we do this slightly differently and take the understanding that we get when we're out in the world um, and make that more a part of what our client is um, uh, involved in. So uh, we found a great opportunity to do this when Duracell, the battery company, came to us and said, we want to research the great outdoors and we want to research consumers in the world of the great outdoors we want to do it slightly differently and we said okay great we've got a plan here so we took them camping so we took them to a national uh park um near san diego in california um and spent um a couple of very cold nights there with them and and a load of other kind of camping enthusiasts and outdoor um enthusiasts and they learned something they learned something that i don't think they would necessarily have learned if we had sort of run a set of focus groups or even to be honest if we had just gone and sat with some campers in their suburban homes and looked through their garages and looked at their tents and their camping equipment they learned something by being immersed in those people's worlds and they learned things that perhaps you'd never think about asking questions about so the example i always use is is hidden on the right hand side of this slide which is a little pit that somebody built on uh, dug under their water container, um, which clearly I would never have, it, have included in my list of questions to ask. But at the time it intrigued me. Why have you built a pit? Why have you dug a pit underneath your water uh, container? And the answer of course was to collect the uh, overflow. So I don't end up with a muddy kind of um, area to sit in. And what that suggested to us was something about craft or something about the kind of professional identity or at least the the identity of, of somebody who takes the outdoors seriously, um, knows how they like things, you know, instills time, money and energy in their kit um, and everything they take with them into uh, the inhospitable um, American outdoors. And this, this that insight <clears throat> truncated somewhat for, for communication purposes led to an incredibly successful marketing campaign that Duracell ran off the back of this and as a result you know we sort of high-fived at the end of this week doing doing some projects uh, doing this project with with Duracell as a team and thought great you know we've we've kind of landed on something as an idea here um, you know this works um, and so then we set out on a process, if you will, of trying to figure out, well, what is it about this that's working? Right? Why did this have an impact on them? And, um, and that led us to the idea of embodied knowledge. Um, and it also led us to this kind of concept of embodied strategy, which is that typically, you know, businesses kind of ask consultants to kind of write strategy documents. Right, and they're often quite dull. Um, you know, they're very unidimensional. You know, it's black words on a white paper on white on a white background, um, and it's somehow fixed. It's fixed in time. It's fixed in the time when it was created, um, but doesn't necessarily have the ability to sort of uh, shape shift as events around it unfold. So we, we chanced upon this piece of writing by a guy called Flint McGoughlin, who talked about kind of good strategy not being declared, but something lived into. And we really like that, that this idea that if you've kind of embodied a world and you've embodied an understanding of something, um, that form of knowledge lives on within you much in a way much longer than any any presentation, any PowerPoint presentation that e any, any consultant, even the very best consultant in the world will ever give you, you know something in a very different way as a result of that. And if you build a strategy from that knowledge, um, it has an ability to evolve as the world around you evolves. So, um, so, so this kind of paper was, was a kind of a, a way of us trying to sort of unpack as it were, I think aloud about what our approach might be and what the thinking behind it might be to support this way of doing things. And, and this way of doing things is, is what we call the studio. Um, it's obviously something that's not particularly kind of COVID friendly anymore. 
um and we can come we can talk about what we're doing instead if you want um but the answer is zoom and neural and that's pretty much the end of it um but in an ideal world what we do with our clients is is build a is build what we call a research studio we take you know eight to ten people with us in out into the world for a week we construct a, a kind of a series of uh, both formal research interviews as well as um, other kind of immersive activities. You know, we do kind of dinner parties where we invite people to the house. You know, we rent houses, as you can see. The ones in America are usually much bigger and grander than the ones in the UK. But um, so we invite people there. We have open house. You know, we get people to come in and talk to us. We go out and we, we program a week or more um, to take a team out of their, you know, out of their corporate offices and into other people's worlds and out of a world of half an hour meetings back to back and a constant interruption and email and, and everything that goes with life in an office to say, you want to study this, you want to understand it, let's go all in together, um, let's get to grips with it um, and let's let's try to unpick what's going on in this space. And as the week progresses, you know, let's try to get to a, a point of view, a shared point of view about what is going on and what this means for us. Um, so <clears throat> just to give you a couple of pro project examples um, that just to a greater or lesser extent of use the studio, um, use the studio approach. Um, so uh, we worked with Google a couple of years back on understanding kind of AI um, powered assistance for knowledge workers. Um, so really the brief was, you know, we want to build, we want to use AI to build tools that will be useful for people using G Suite as it was then known. Um, you know, what should they be and why? Um, and, and what shouldn't they be? you know, as is often the case, is the more important and relevant question, actually. Um, and, the, and the what shouldn't they be um, was, actually, was actually stuff, um, as we saw it, that focused, that, that was, you know, was assistance that focused on the type of work that people see as core to their identity as employees. So in other words, we kind of created a vision of, of, of people's work that was involved both peripheral work so a lot of the what i would call nonsense that a lot of us have to do for a lot of the day booking meeting rooms get, trying to find an available time for three or four people to all meet versus kind of core work which is the work that actually i feel like i'm paid for that makes me happy that's central to my identity and is going to get me promoted if i do it well and we said well AI should be doing the stuff that no one really likes and it's, it's peripheral to their existence, but it still gets in the way and should steer clear to some extent of, um, of the work that is much more nuanced, much more, it's much more human ultimately. Um, so, um, so to the question about sort of, you know, algorithms and how we engage there, I mean, this is quite a good example, if you will, right, which is to say, um, don't try and impinge on the stuff that people actually have take a lot of pleasure in, you know, try to pick off um, the forms of work or the types of work that people find less pleasurable, but, but no less important um, in their day to day existence. Um, so this case study is available on our website. Google amazingly let us reproduce pretty much the entire um, uh, entire case um so it's 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 all legally approved for dissemination uh and i think you might find it quite interesting a second piece of work um that i've chosen to showcase was just something around um new hardware experiences in the world of remote work which is obviously something that um, we're all quite familiar with these days um and um and this has been as is often the case, a kind of a multi-project study, you know, so one piece of work kind of begets some output, some outcomes, but, but throws up further questions, or in the case of COVID situations change. And instead of thinking about people working in coffee shops, we're now talking about corporate workers 
you know, sitting at a kitchen table in their home. So how does this impact kind of, you know, the relative role of different technologies in people's lives, smartphone versus laptop, you know, and, and how people are trying to get work done in, in these kinds of evolving work, working environments. Um, and I think one of the things we've, you know, a good example of, of how we try to sort of, uh, try to have impact as we go through a project and to build a community around the work within our client organizations um, is to do a weekly newsletter, you know, which gets shared within, you know, the broader audience of the people um, whose work will be touched upon by, by our research, um, by our investigations. Um, and again, this work is published. It's on, um, I think it's published um on our website um and has resulted in um you know quite technical stuff um actually and and kind of an in, interesting in a sense that you know our kind of very grounded research leads to kind of very technical kind of architecture definition for laptops so there's a kind of a really interesting layering of of work from from eth from ethnography through to to sort of pretty hardcore, um, you know, hardware, uh, software, um, uh, architecting. Um, so a couple of examples, there's quite a lot of other things on our, on our website that you might like, but I hope that gives you some of a flavor, some, something of a flavor of, um, um, of, of what Stripe Partners is, is up to and, and why we do it the way we do it. So uh, I had a question, Simon. So sure. I just wanted to, you know, so as a student of anthropology or as an academic creative, right? So there is all, there is this thought that um, you can understand a context or a culture only if you immerse in it for a long period of time, right? So there's mm. this idea of maybe an ethnography here and so on, right? And it is definitely not possible in a business setting. Uh, so you talked about, you know, immersing for a week in a particular place, getting them yeah. together, getting them yeah. lives so how do you kind of you know between these two um how do you find that uh, you know that sweet spot in terms of saying that we're doing um, you know high quality ethnography mm. and keeping our limitations in mind yeah good question um yeah i mean so clearly this is very different from from 18 months kind of unstructured long-term observation um and clearly there are people that would say well this this, this couldn't or shouldn't ever claim to be kind of ethnography. And, uh, yeah, that's a different debate. Um, uh, I think for us, you know, we make uh, what I think are, um, what I think, are, uh, you know, are, are quite, um, how do I put it? Um, we make quite unreasonable demands of our clients. I mean, you know, we are, we're asking for a team to sort of leave the office for a week. Um, and, and we do that not necessarily just because you need at least a week, as it were, in order to, to kind of understand a, a, a cultural phenomenon or an, a, a social context or cultural context. Um, but more, I think, for me, it comes down to a theory of kind of how change happens in an organization. And, it, and change for me happens in an organization when a small but critical number of important and not important in terms of grade or seniority. Um, uh, you know, when a small number of important people know what's going on and know what ha needs to happen as a result. So, so for me, um, I'm very happy with the idea that we can, you know, that we can kind of collapse, if you will, 18 months into, into a week. On the rigor side, I think, you know, as, as I suggested with this sort of Intel thing, having worked at Intel and having worked on projects for Intel for, you know, uh, now over 15 years, I understand the environment quite well at Intel and so, and I understand the technology reasonably well. So 
So I'm never starting afresh. So I think a lot of this is both at an industry level, but also perhaps at a cultural level. We do huge amounts of research in America. We have American team members, have non-American team members too. Um, for me, a lot of this is about, you know, is really about saying, you know, this is a, there's a continuum, uh, there's a continuity to the way that research gets done. So studies build on each other. So in fact, it's a long-term, uh, in a sense, there's a long-term engagement, if you will, with a, with a, with a cultural uh, environment um, or, or a market. Um, and then from a rigor perspective, you know, I like to think we're, you know, uh, we're, I mean, industry leading sounds kind of slightly, um, slightly over egging it, but, you know, we're incredibly rigorous about transcribing of notes and um, being exceptionally thorough with our data. Um, uh, and so it's not just looking for a, a quote that supports an idea, but actually trying to do rigorous analysis of the data to get to the ideas which we can then support with data. So, um, so yeah, two or three different ways of answering that question. Sure, thanks. I mean, I don't know how much time people have. I mean, I was going to talk about my book, but I mean, I could just at least flick it there and you can all run off to, um, to um, your local bookstore and buy it. Um, and then that's, that's that job done. Um, um, I mean, I'm very happy to talk about it, but, but equally it's, it's another 10 or 15 minutes and there's plenty of other questions. So um, I'm, you know, I'm just as happy to, um, I'm just as happy to sort of continue this Q and A around what we what, what I've talked about already. I mean, I think I think since it's informing your uh, your firm, and I think it's a, a distinct yeah. approach. Like, if you don't mind, like talking a little bit. I about don't it. mind. Yeah. yeah, I'll be I'll try and be super quick. Um, so, I imagine most of you listening can ride a bicycle, um, and a you know, and if you can't, um, uh, it's probably only because you've never tried, um, but it's, it's a reasonably easy thing to do. And most of, most people uh, who've ever tried get it um, and, and learn how to do it pretty quickly, right? But then if I was to ask you, how do you ride a bicycle? I think you'd find it rather harder to tell me how you are actually doing it. And, um, <clears throat> and this this uh, uh, mechanical engineer Mont Hubbard talks talks well of this. You know, everyone knows how to ride a bike, but nobody knows how we ride bikes. Actually, it's something that I write about in the book. People have been trying to figure out for for hundreds of years, and um, and in a way, kind of this form of knowledge, you know, just jumping on a bike and cycling off is embodied knowledge, right? And this form of knowledge, you know, equations and and whatnot, um, and diagrams and so forth, is 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 sort of explicit um, or or as one might call it, propositional knowledge. That's so a very different form of knowledge, and I think traditionally, consultants in my world, okay, we don't use equations and diagrams like this, but traditionally we traded in this, right, um, and very rarely have we traded in that. Um, and yet this is exactly, I think, what I talked about in the context of, of sort of Duracell, right? It's like, if you want to know how to ride a bike, you need to learn how to ride a bike, right? And it doesn't actually matter to you once you've learned how to do that, whether you really understand how you're doing it. You don't really need to understand the equation. In the same way, you don't really, uh, you know, you can build a marketing campaign, a really successful marketing campaign for Duracell, by learning how to camp and learning what camping is all about by doing it. And you don't need this, but yet the business world is obsessed by things like this or their moral equivalents, right? So, so for me, kind of embodied knowledge is, you know, I talk about it in terms of a sort of knowledge where we've acquired practical understanding and abilities through perception or experience. So it's, it's, it's phenomenological. Um, uh, at the end of the day um, and when we have this kind of knowledge we instinctively know how to act 
right? Which is why I think that business needs a bit more of this, which is not to say we all need to fly blind or we should ignore data, but it's rather that actually if our instincts, which as Daniel Kahneman says, are often our instincts are wrong and we leap to them, but they're wrong. But if we take time to build kind of knowledge which can inform our instincts, it's more likely to be right. So we just need the right tools to build that sort of knowledge. And it's a very different form of knowledge from the form of knowledge that is given emphasis um, and is privileged. Um, I suspect not least, in, not just in the Western world and every book needs a baddie and my baddie's Descartes. Um, and I, you know, and I think, you know, at its simplest, in its simplest form, you know, the uh, cogito, you know, I think therefore I am, you know, created a world in which, you know, what happens above the shoulders is more important than what happens below the shoulders. And so my book is really an attempt to say, well, there's sort of quite two, diff two, two quite different ways of thinking about how we understand the world um and we live in a very head or brain centered way of of, of looking at, at knowledge and we need a bit more of, of 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 the body um and we need that because um in fact our view of the brain um as the should we say the control tower um is, is of course one that's infected how we think about computers and in fact computers are you know the brain is increasingly seen as, as well, as, has traditionally been seen as sort of a bit like a computer. Um, and it's kind of, it's, they've, we've got it the wrong way around in a way. Um, and what struck me when I wrote the book was how many different disciplines are kind of coming at the body um, from their own disciplinary perspectives and all reaching the same conclusion, which is that kind of without bodies, there's really, there's no, there's no kind of sensible way to think about thinking. Um, you know, they are our interfaces with the world. And if we just take our brains and we put them in a vat and we just plug it, plug them into something like the brain is not interacting with anything. It's our bodies that interact with the world. Therefore our bodies should be, um, we should privilege what are the role that our bodies are, are playing in the way that we understand the world. So what I do in the book is really just run through and, you know, it's it's not a book written for academics. I wrote it for my mother, you know, so that my mother could read it. That was the ideal audience. So I break down this very kind of complex in a way, um, you know, thing called embodied knowledge into five kind of qualities or characteristics. So the first is about, it, about observation, which is really about immersion. And it's about saying we live in a very ocular centric world as I've discovered with a detached retina over the last couple of months. Um, but actually most of our understanding of the world actually comes from beyond our eyes. Um, this is a British designer who wanted to know what it was like to be a goat. So he, he made a goat suit um, and pretended to be a goat um, as a way of getting closer to the goat world. Um, so really this is, this is about sort of observation in non kind of ocular forms. It's about, you know, the idea of embodied immersion. Um, I then talk a lot about practice. So the ways in which we develop, um, often very sophisticated, complex skills through their performance, through their repetition and performance. And I talk about, um, or use uh hubert dreyfus's kind of model of skill acquisition from novice to expert to talk about the ways in which as it were kind of linguistic understandings of 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 what we should do think of them think of that as a recipe in a recipe book for how to make something and that becomes very important to us at the beginning of learning how to do something as we acquire expertise we no longer need need that our body just knows what to do so embodied knowledge is, is something that we acquire through practice and through repetition. Um, embodied knowledge has great improvisational uh, capabilities. So think back again to the Duracell thing, right? The world changes around anyone in business. And rather than have to go back to a consultant and say, the world's changed, what should we do now? 
you know, if you put somebody in a world and say, well, you understand that world now, you can make some of those decisions for yourself. That is because you have embodied knowledge of an environment. And we use improvisation um, in, in many, many aspects of our lives, perhaps nearly all of them. But in this chapter, I talk a lot about self-driving cars and about the fact that, um, you know, the principal problem that self-driving car designers have run into is, um, is, not, is, is not least that the world around us changes quite a lot. Roads actually change a lot more than we think. No journey is ever the same. Never, we never, a car never encounters the same conditions twice. Um, and, and, you know, arguably it's our sensory perception of the world that allows us to make sense of things. And what autonomous vehicle manufacturers are, are struggling with is, is how do you model the world? Um, I also talk about empathy. So this is something that happens in um, Davos every year, but it is actually much goes on in many other contexts too and it's a 24-hour refugee simulator um and so i talk about empathy as typically something that is is given psychological kind of uh time is, is talked about in psychological ways but is actually very embodied um and the ways in which we understand other people we understand their emotions we understand what they're experiencing we understand simply put we understand others when we're in contact with them right which is one of the reasons why covid has been so horrible for most of us right is because um actually it's that physical not only the physical contact a hug um and everything that that begets but it's also the ways in which bodies entrain with each other in other words they resonate with each other that's why crowds are uh have such power why you know uh, the UK House of Commons looks very different when it's only got 20 people on either side of the house, right? And there's no one shouting. Um, it's emptied of all mood and atmosphere. So this is a chapter that explores the role of the body in creating mood and atmosphere and ultimately empathy. Um, and because no um, book should have, um, should be uh, not have a reference to Varanasi in it somewhere, um, this is a tali from a lovely Gujarati restaurant in, um, no, it's not Gujarati. Um, I think it's Punjabi restaurant in, in Varanasi that I ate at when I was doing field work. It was my sort of special treat. Um, and when I went back there 20 years later, I was magically transferred, transported back to 20 years previously, partly because this paneer dish at the bottom just tasted exactly the same as it had 20 years previously and I was magically uh you know I was magically transported back to another era um and that is because our bodies are tremendous stores of knowledge um and whether that's kind of um whether that's you know the uh, you know memories of places whether that's the ways in which we understand landscape and move around landscape or micro environments like supermarkets, whether it's the, the cold area of a supermarket or the slightly warmer, different, you know, the smellier bread related made, making areas of a supermarket. As we move through landscapes, our body is able to pick up all range of inputs about that environment that help us ultimately navigate it in, in different ways uh, and remember it. So, I then take these five ideas and then funnel them into uh, some some different contexts in which um, embodied knowledge um, is currently being used, um, either knowingly or unknowingly. So the world of creativity and design, the world of politics and policy making, the world of business, and and finally the world of robotics and AI, which is making most of its breakthroughs through uh, through a, a kind of a coming to terms if you will with the idea of of embodiment so um that's a whistle stop tour of the book <laughs> thank you uh thank you thank you simon um there are some interesting questions um i mean there are lots of questions i mean i, I yeah. guess you could pick uh, whatever you want but uh i think like the last one i thought i thought was interesting how is business anthropology different from user research 
in uh, human computer interaction or is it the two sides of the same coin i guess mm. it goes back to you know when you have clients approach you and say like oh what 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 are you guys you know what is stripe partners are you guys a, a design agency are yeah you, yeah you know, a user experience uh, you know yeah. most, even on even on epic most of the job ads that i see are always say you know user experience researchers or design researcher like yeah they never say, they never say uh anthropologist or ethnographer anymore yeah yeah um yeah it's a very i mean i i sort of there's one reason why i'm very glad i started my career a long time ago because the world was much sort of simpler then um it's splintered into so many sub-disciplines um and and i think um you know what's the simple answer i mean user experience design user experience research and this is my answer of course um i take to be um well look i'll back up i think this one can think of kind of the use of this kind of research in general on a continuum from kind of front end to uh sort of fuzzy front end of innovation to shall we say um you know the marketing and shipping of a product out into the world right and and personally i've 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 spent more of my career at the fuzzier front end in other words what is going on in the world what does that mean for you as a business what technologies capabilities you know do you have what do you where do you want to point them this is where you could point them and you know and then people who work in the kind of marketing space at the other end you know that product is defined the positioning is is kind of is kind of set you know how are we going to how are we going to get it into people's hands and i think user experience design is is sort of sits somewhere in the middle of those right which is about saying okay this is what a product needs to do this is where how it's going to be architected and user experience is about sort of saying, well, how are we going to make that? Um, how are we going to make it a joy to use? How are we going to make it easy to use? How are we going to ensure that we hold the product people's, um, what the product people do to account, as it were, for what we've identified earlier on in the process that people actually want or need? Um, so I think, you know, a lot of this is kind of about angels dancing on the pin of a head. At the end of the day, what brings us all together, and I, I think for me, that's the important thing, is that we are about the voice of people and of culture and of humans in the room, right? And, and if we're doing our job well, then every discipline that's elsewhere represented in the room, whether it's engineering or marketing or finance or corporate strategy should all be listening to us and taking what we say seriously um because ultimately good products that delight people and that co have commercial value will come from and his i think history shows will come from a good understanding of of where people are as it were where the world is at and what sort of world do people want to see and what don't they want to see so um so a, we can have a longer debate about disciplinary kind of sub-disciplines but actually i think i prefer to look at kind of what brings us together right which is about being the voice of of people uh humans um i guess you know you know we, we're gonna maybe do like one or two more questions i have a question since like we you know this is about uh like we're, we're hosting this as part of the uh Consumer Culture Lab um, in Udaipur, and I know that you know from experience that you know ethnographers, including yourself, you know often come to do field work in in Asia for corporate clients. Um, and I just wonder, like, what do you see as like the you know the future of this kind of practice in Asia or for Asia or or by people in Asia? Um, you know, I see I see a lot of you know people flying in into asia you know coming from like the west to do this kind of work yeah yeah uh, which i don't think is necessarily ideal yeah uh, um and so I, I guess the question for me is always like you know what, what is the future of this kind of work um you know in asia 
you know, for Asia, but, you know, by people in Asia, I guess. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, in simple terms, actually, I think the future is it's, it's, it's by, with, and for people in market. Um, we definitely, um, you, you know, we are very, we're very proactively, uh, we're pr very proactively thinking about what that means for us. Um, I think that is right. Um, for not least, there are many reasons why that's the right way for things to go. Not least, I think it's about capability building. And, you know, um, uh, I'm not into the idea of a world in which Western educated consultants um, from Western companies um, do research in environments which they don't really understand. Um, so um, I, of course, would like to think I have um, uh, I have a small case to make for doing work in India, but elsewhere. In fact, we work very closely with some wonderful, you know, group of a couple of wonderful companies in India. Um, we pretty much always outsource the majority of what we do to them and then work really closely with them. Um, and I think that's actually what a lot of our clients are wanting more of as well. Um, so they want that capability built in market um, and they want a local perspective. And I think that's right. Um, and I think on the other hand, what they do want is companies perhaps with a little more experience at the strategy end to help bring things together. Um, so there's, which is not to say that that capability is not present in some of these markets. Um, but actually if you're running kind of significant studies in multiple markets, you actually need somebody to try to bring something together. So it's coherent and it's, and a simple story and simple implications are told. So, so I think, you know, the future is, is kind of local in this space. Um, and that, that's something I would support for sure. Yeah, there were a lot of questions, I guess, around, uh, you know, what does, uh, COVID, uh, entail, yeah. um, for, um, uh, for you and your company, I guess, uh, you know, you talked about the studios not being, yeah. Able yeah. To that, uh, you're the founder of a firm with 24 anthropologists. Uh, many of them yeah. are PhDs on the payroll. So, yeah. uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, like, how does this affect you and your firm? Um, well, happily, financially, it hasn't actually had much of an impact on us. Um, and that's largely to, you know, the huge amount of work that the team have done, um, you know, in really difficult circumstances, you know, look, in reality, what this has meant is a lot of doom and zoom. Um, and, you know, uh, and that kind of work is exhausting, right? And it's a lot less fun than traveling. It's much better for the environment, um, data centers and their impacts notwithstanding. Um, and in many ways, in, in many ways, it makes a lot more sense to do things in this way. So, you know, we have, you know, we are now doing everything remotely. Um, as I said, sometimes that kind of makes sense. Um, and sometimes it makes me reflect on the fact that some of the trips that I've been on have been, you know, ultimately really rather extravagant. Um, on the other hand, I think we all recognize that something is missing, right? And, um, you know, it's a bit like a sort of a diet of, of, of sort of, I don't know what the, cultural equivalent is but you know diet of just oatmeal for a year right it's like you, you know there's no variety either for us as a team um but actually i think you, you know it works in the short term it won't work in the long term so um my long-term worry is that clients will start to think oh we can do everything remotely and I think that will be an enormous mistake. And I'm not just saying that because I'm self-interested in it not being the case. I genuinely think, you know, researchers and their clients need to get out in the world if they want to understand it. And actually after the year that or so that we've all had, um, getting out there and seeing where the dust has settled is more important than ever. Um, However, I do think there are lots of opportunities to reduce our carbon footprint and to do things slightly more efficiently uh, without traveling a lot of the time. Um, 
but I have, has to have to say that organizing large international studies using Zoom is takes, I would say maybe 20 or 30% more time and resource from our end. So actually the idea that, that somehow this is simpler or cheaper in kind of team time is for the birds, it's really not, it's not quicker and easier and, and therefore not cheaper uh, on a time and materials basis. Um, so um, anyway, that's one to have a conversation with the bean counters with when, when we can travel again and they've decided that they enjoy the fact there's no international travel in their budgets. Um, we need to go into battle. <laughs> Right. Maybe we can do like one last question and, uh, and wrap it up. And there were, there were different questions in the Q and A, which were more like, you know, people want to become, you know, business anthropologists is there, is there, you think like a, a bright future for people who want to do this kind of work, uh, demand on the, the corporate side, on the consulting side, uh, you know, what advice do you have for the, uh, you know, people who want to get into this kind of, uh, this kind of work, you know, in terms of, uh, um, you know, I'll also like, you know, um, when I teach, you know, often I, I guess, you know, uh, questions from students about, you know, what should I, what should I do? What should I study? Uh, yeah. what kind of experience should I, should I gather? Should I do yeah. a master's? Should I do a PhD? Yeah. Um, you know. um, definitely get into this space. I mean, I'm, I'm very biased, but, um, you know, I've loved, I've loved, you know, my career's not over. I'd be claiming that it is if I said this, I said that the way I was about to say, it. yeah, I have loved my career to date. You know, I've, I've had so much fun. I've so enjoyed the sort of work that I've been doing and, and I feel like it's the best of both worlds. It's kind of academic stimulation, lots of ideas, lots of brilliant experiences um fantastically tricky kind of client problems um do you need a phd i'm not so sure you do um anymore i do think you know and i'll say this from our perspective at stripe partners i think um whilst we have hired people with you know an undergraduate degree in in anthropology uh, and we have hired people with degree with 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 phds in anthropology um, and they're clearly smart people. Um, uh, we also, you know, we also are very interested in often people with masters. So I think sometimes it's worth thinking about whether a masters might be sufficient if you know that you don't want to continue in academia. Um, and, and in many parts of the world, a PhD is uh, in America is a very long process and very expensive. So, you know, um, so what, what, what can you do about it? Um, you know, internships are a very good place to start. Um, Stripe Partners will be launching an internship program this week for another couple of slots. Um, so advance warning of that. Um, uh, I think, you know, getting pick, you know, turning up to events, um, reading stuff, writing for it. The conference is virtual this year. That makes it way more affordable for people from elsewhere in the world. Um, that don't have um, access to, uh, you know, travel budgets and expensive hotel bills, um, et cetera. So, so I would heartily recommend joining the conference this year is probably the best place to find out what people are actually up to and to network, albeit online. Um, and what else I would, would I do? Um, just plug away at it i mean i you know i'm biased and you know i think well i, I think stripe partners is a very interesting place you know there aren't i don't think there are quite as many companies that are quite as biased um but i think um there are lots of companies out there doing very similar things um but it's not a it's not a super big niche you know it, it's quite a small niche um and, and I think a lot of the big tech companies, you know, can pick and choose a bit and they probably would want more demonstration of advanced, of advanced qualifications. Um, but, um, you know, 
within reason you know my my email is you know connect and and i'm happy to chat to people if they need guidance or or what have you so um all um, right so you know we've had like you know comments from people from the philippines and kenya and uh, i'm in singapore you know rajesh is in uh, uh, Rajesh, you're in Kerala, or uh, Rupali is in Delhi, you're in London, so I guess like one of the advantages of this is... Uh, exactly, exactly. We're, we're able to connect, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, Rajesh, you're, you're in Kerala right now? Yeah, that's right, in Kerala. In the middle of a storm, basically, so yeah. Middle of a storm in Kerala, right. Yeah, so, yeah. So, um, yeah, different people in uh, in India. And uh, yeah, I mean, like, you know, we do hope, like Simon, maybe uh, to get you involved in, in other activities of the lab or, you know, maybe research or uh, writing or, yeah. you know, you, you've been, uh, you know, when, when, when hopefully this COVID uh, thing is over, uh, uh, maybe we can all meet somewhere uh, in India and um, maybe even teach together in, uh, in India. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, and then uh, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, Pleasure. I have lots of questions, but uh, you know, I think it's uh, getting late, uh, at least in Singapore. Uh, yeah, yeah so I imagine it from, is uh, from Madison, Wisconsin. So like different, lots of different time zones, uh, which is uh, which is great, and um, I'm glad. Uh, also, uh, that uh, I am I am Udaipur uh, is also getting some exposure uh, through this, and uh, yeah, I don't know, Rupali, you want to say uh, a few last words or? This was uh, extremely exciting to be a part of. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing all these uh, exciting views. Um, it's been yeah, like a really wonderful experience to listen to all of this. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's been brilliant to do it. So, um, and yeah, hope and, and maybe we'll uh, about views. the questions. You know, Rupali, uh, you know, we'll be recording some of these questions, and maybe you know, we'll create a document and make it a blog. Maybe if, Simon, if you have any time to answer any of these, yeah, 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 uh, totally. You know, we can create a create a document and maybe uh, uh, have some uh, references and links. Uh, you know, to uh, to some of these readings and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah, Rupali, be in touch. Yes. Right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks. For okay, great. Thanks for having me. All Enjoy right. your day or evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Should I stop the recording? Yes, please.